Hi, I'm Jackie with Military Saves, and I'd like to welcome you to our Midday Money Chat, where we are on week four of Military Saves Month. Today, we're talking about saving by reducing debt, and we've got two fabulous guests with us today. Now, before I introduce them to you, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about a couple of opportunities for you. The first one is while we're doing lives on this chat, if you post your favorite takeaway in the comments below, you are in the running for a $50 gift card of your choice from our friends at Military Families Magazine. So good luck with that. Secondly, be sure to enter our $500 I'm saving for sweepstakes by taking the Military Saves Pledge, by joining our Military Saves Facebook group, and by using the hashtag in that group, telling us what you're saving for and say, hashtag I'm saving for sweepstakes. Good luck. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our two guests today. We're going to start with Bruce McClary. Bruce is the Senior Vice President of Communications for the National Foundation for Credit Counseling, also known as the NFCC. Bruce has experience as a lender and debt collector and is considered a subject matter expert and interfaces with the national media. For more than 23 years, Bruce has provided one-on-one -on -one financial counseling to thousands of consumers, trained financial educators, and reached millions more through print and broadcast media, and now today here on Military Saves. <laughs> Bruce, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for, thanks for letting me join the conversation, Jackie. Absolutely. And next, we've got Tom Quinn. Tom is the Vice President of Scores with FICO. And with over 25 years experience at FICO, Tom has established history working with regulators, legislators, lenders, and the media and other industry entities to help them better understand the power of credit scoring technology and its benefits to the financial industry and consumers. And fun fact, Tom was my first military saves interview back in October, and now you're back. Thanks for joining us again. Great to be here. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. All right. So today we are discussing how to save by reducing debt because when you're saving or when you're paying your debt, you are saving on late fees, you're saving on interest, you're actually building peace of mind as well. So we're going to talk about how you get into debt, how you get out of debt and how that affects your credit. So debt is something that's very easy to accrue, but it's very difficult to get out of. Um, and it can start from something necessary like a medical purchase, auto repairs, um, it can even be from setting up your new home every time you PCS to a new duty station, or it can be from buying your dream car with a really high APR. <laughs> so I personally had student loan debt and credit debt for a while, which thankfully it is all paid off now. Um, so I do know how it can affect um, your other finances, how it affects your emotions. So before we go into kind of the nitty gritty of managing debt and how it affects your credit, let's first talk ways to avoid getting into debt in the first place. So we're gonna start with you, Tom. Can you please share ways that people get into debt and is there really good debt? Is that a thing? Sure, sure. So one thing I think it's really important to note is that debt in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It, it does get a bad rap in the, uh, the media, mm -hmm. but for millions of Americans, uh, for example, they've built wealth through debt, like uh, taking out a mortgage loan and through home ownership, that was only possible for most of us to be able to get a house if we took on a mortgage. So debt in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. However, it does become negative when it becomes unmanageable for the individual. You know, for example, someone who's, let's say, living off their credit card cards. So common ways that I hear of people getting into debt, uh, large amounts of student loan is very common. I know that I dealt with that in my younger years as well. Uh, an unexpected high expense in events such as a car needing to be replaced or major repairs or a natural disaster that you didn't plan for and you don't have any cash reserves on hand. And that gets to kind of a lack of a rainy day savings fund that uh, consumers should take on to, to uh, be ready if there's un, uh, unanticipated expenses at services. And then living beyond one means is another reason that people get into debt. And this especially I see happens with young people who may not have the uh, background and educational knowledge of how uh, the cycle of debt just increases and continues to roll on as you get into debt earlier in your life. And then kind of trying to climb out of that could be very difficult. Excellent. And you are right about um, the younger populations. I know that when I was young, this was 
uh, I'd like to think I'm still young, <laughs> but the very first <laughs> credit card that I applied for, they gave me a $20,000 limit. And I, at the time was working at a grocery store for $4 and 45 cents an hour. And I was a college student. Why they would grant me that, I don't know. Um, luckily now there seems to be some better regulation, um, but I didn't have the tools and I just thought, oh, this is great. I can, I tried to buy, you know, necessary purchases. Sometimes it was textbooks, but other times there were things that I look back on and they weren't necessary. Um, so I, I agree. And what's interesting about our military community is that so many people join right out of high school. So we have 18 year olds that all of a sudden can, um, they've got their free housing, their health care, they've got the steady pay and they want to buy a car or a motorcycle. And so it can just compound quickly. Uh, so I'm glad that you brought that up that financial education is the key. So thank you, Tom. Um, Bruce, I've got a question for you now. Um, your organization, the NFCC, wants to promote the financial health of consumers, which I love. So from your experience, um, for what reasons do people go into debt? Well, I think I, I just to uh, dovetail a little bit off of what Tom said, you know, a loan or a line of credit isn't necessarily a bad thing. And credit can be used for a, a lot of different purposes. And I think it is a great tool to build a solid foundation when it comes to your credit score and your overall credit health. Uh, certainly can be a good tool for that. But for the reasons that people go into debt, uh, it varies uh, depending on a person's circumstances. I think commonly, again, just to reference something that Tom brought up, uh, major, uh, major life events like attending university or buying a car or purchasing a home those are times when people uh, get into a significant amount of debt, uh, depending on their needs and the circumstances. Uh, but there's other debt that, that people can accumulate, other types of debt. And typically that comes in the form of a, of a credit card or a line of credit, a revolving line of credit, which is a tool of convenience so that you can go and you can purchase things without having to have cash on hand and have the convenience of repaying that debt uh, uh, on, a, on a more affordable schedule, which is fine. But I think that's the debt that really trips people up. Because if you think about it, if you're, if you're just focusing on the minimum payment and you think that that's something you can afford, uh, that can creep up on you as a problem and go from being manageable to, as Tom described, being unmanageable. And uh, with the high interest rates uh, that are associated with credit card debt, that can be a bit of an issue. So the, and the credit card debt, the, the credit card is a gateway for getting into debt for all kinds of reasons, uh, good or bad. Uh, spur of the moment purchases, impulse buys, emergencies while you're traveling and you don't happen to have the cash on hand, uh, all kinds of, of reasons that, uh, that can be behind the, the types of things that you would put on a credit card. And I think that's, that's one of the areas of spending that we see most commonly at the NFCC are the situations where people ended up getting into unmanageable credit card debt. The other types of loans and lines of credit are things that people see on their radar constantly. It's not something that sneaks up on you. When you, get, when you borrow a student loan, you know what you're getting. You know the amount you have to repay, the term, et cetera. Uh, same thing with a mortgage and an auto loan. Um, but it's the credit card debt that is probably the most troubling. Great, thank you. And I know that debt can be a very emotional topic. And we even interviewed um, just a few months ago a military spouse who ended up paying off six figures in debt. But for her, a lot of it was uh, because of emotional purchases. She was feeling unhappy. So there was retail therapy. And a lot of times people buy hoping that they'll feel better. And then in the end, they're finding that now they've got debt and now they can't afford what they really want in life. And so it's something that happens to, that can happen very easily. Um, and we just wanted you to know that with Military Saves, what we practice here is behavioral economics. So we really focus on making those little choices and making saving a habit, saving automatically, having an emergency fund so you don't have to dip into the credit card. Um, and so for anyone watching who has debt, we'll be sure to drop um, some free resources in the comments below to help you with that. So Bruce, let's go ahead and talk about a little bit more about the credits. Um, so can you talk about the importance of APR, chipping away at principal instead of interest only and making early payments on your debt? Yeah, there, uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can approach uh, debt repayment and come up with an effective strategy that helps you get ahead of the cost of repaying debt and also affordably uh, manage your overall outlay uh, and make sure that you're balancing your budget so not too much money is going to, to, your, to your lines of credit and your loans where it might otherwise be going to other things like savings, which I know we're gonna talk about. Um, 
but there's a there's an age old rule when it comes to credit card debt that making the minimum payment just simply doesn't get you anywhere and it, and it makes it more costly to repay the debt over time. And that's been proven over and over and over again. And in fact, it's clearly disclosed to you in your credit card statement. When you look at the, uh, the when you look at the statement, you'll see what they call the Schumer box, which uh, discloses how long it would take you to pay off the credit card debt over time if you're just making minimum payments. So the best rule of thumb for your credit card debt, first of all, is to keep your balance low, to keep it manageable. If you do have to carry a balance, and there are other reasons that you should keep a low balance uh, with respect to your uh, overall credit utilization ratio, uh, which I'm sure Tom could get into. But it, there's also, um, you know, it just also keeps it affordable. So, you know, we recommend that you should probably never have a carry a balance uh, that, is, that takes up more than 30% of your overall assigned credit limit, the lower the better for you, just for your bottom line. Uh, the other thing is to make sure you're making, you're paying more than the minimum payment when you can't pay off the entire balance uh, when, at times when you can't pay it off immediately. And any amount over the minimum is helpful because uh, when you think about the average interest rates on credit cards, right now we're looking at about 15, 16%. Uh, that's a very high interest rate compared to other types of credit, especially collateralized loans. So you want to make sure that you're, you're putting as much money as possible to pay down as much of the principal and get around the interest rate. Paying your purchases off immediately is the best strategy because then you're reducing the cost to the absolute minimum. You're not having to worry about the interest rate. And when you're making those payments uh, as quickly as possible, you're also not having to worry about paying late. There are penalties for late payments, uh, and those penalties can be very costly, and they can add up. Uh, the monthly cost for a late payment uh, can be about twenty-five dollars per account that you're that you're uh, not paying on time. Uh, that coupled with over limit fees, that can be costly there as well. So pay off again. Just pay as much over the minimum payment as you possibly can. Pay off your purchases immediately, if at all possible. Uh, I think you still benefit from some of the advantages of carrying the line of credit. Uh, even if you're paying the balances off immediately, you can still accrue reward points. Uh, you can still benefit from the convenience and the flexibility of having a credit card account. Uh, but again, the thing is to create, to balance that with the other obligations that you have in your budget. So it's very important to keep a budget while you're doing this as well. So you can understand exactly how much of your income you can allocate to these credit card payments to get traction and pay it off uh, quicker and more affordably. Fantastic. I really like what you said about don't carry more than 30% of your total credit limit as a balance. That's good. That's a very good metric to have for anyone tuning in. So Tom, what are your thoughts on credit cards? For example, should buyers open store cards for discounts? I know oftentimes your approach either in stores or online, say 10%, 15% if you open up a store card. Um, and does opening these types of cards hurt your credit score overall? Yeah, so um, I think it's important to understand that as cash becomes less commonly used in our economic system and plastic becomes more heavily used, whether that's a debit card or a credit card, or electronic transfers of funds. Um, you know, using a credit card can be a very convenient and safe way to purchase goods. Uh, so there are benefits to using cards, as Bruce indicated. And if paid in full each month, you avoid those horrible high interest rate charges and can help your FICO scores um, increase over time as well. And my thinking is if you favor a particular retailer, like say Target or Best Buy or something, it can be advantageous to use their card because they provide loyalty perks to you that can result in some substantial savings. So I think they're, they, they have benefits and it just depends on what you like as a, as a consumer. If you'd like to you know, favor a certain retailer, then take advantage of that. In terms of uh, your FICO score, you just want to be careful that you don't apply for a bunch of credit card in a short period of time, because that can be seen as risky in the scores in the score calculation, as it needs time to see that you can manage and take on that uh, new credit safely. So if you're in the shopping mall on a Saturday and you see those signs of uh, get 10% off or get a free teddy bear or whatever, if you sign up for new credit, um, just think twice before the, doing that to make sure that that's something that you really need and you'll use and don't uh, kind of Fit your fatten up your wallet with cards that you don't really need or use. What well, actually? Just, oh, go ahead. Bruce. Uh, if I could just follow on that because that's some real. I, I loved what you said about these uh, the retail cards, Tom. Because it's not often said enough. I mean, there are certain if it works to your advantage, 
there are certain rewards and perks and benefits for loyalty with these cards. But the one thing I would caution people about is to give, give, give yourself enough time to read the terms and conditions of an offer before you accept it. A lot of times you're presented with the retail line of credit offer at the register when you're checking out at the store. That store clerk is not a credit expert <clears throat> and they're not there to answer all your questions about the terms and conditions of the card. So you need to give yourself, I would say, uh, call it a cooling off period from the time that you're initially presented with the offer to a time that's sufficient enough for you to review all the terms and conditions, answer all the questions that you have about the card and use of the card to see if it's a good fit for you and if it'll work. And if it is, then fine, go for it. But don't, you know, don't uh, go and feel pressure to sign up for that account immediately at the point where you're making the purchase uh, because you could be doing yourself more harm than good. Great, right, Bruce. Thank you for that thought. And I actually used to work in retail and I would receive a bonus if I recommended someone to sign up for, yes. And if they got approved, then that was extra money. So do keep in mind um, that sometimes these young folks in their teens and twenties offering this to you, they really don't know. <laughs> They're just looking for that quick incentive. Um, so actually I have a quick follow-up question, Tom, because you mentioned a wallet full of these cards. Do you recommend once they're paid off, do you close them or do you keep them? What's the best for your credit score? Right. So from a credit score perspective, there's no advantage to closing down a credit card account. So if you have a couple of credit cards that you don't use that are in the bureau drawer in your dresser and um, you say, clean out your dresser one day and say, wow, I should call these up and close them down because they're hurting my credit. Actually, there are, no, there are no negative impact from having those on your FICO score. And actually, it could hurt your score if you close them down. Uh, and that's due to something called credit utilization that Bruce had mentioned before. But one of the biggest factors that the score is considering is how much of your available credit you're using. So if you have you know, two credit cards and your total available credit is $5,000 and you have $2,500 balance on both of them combined, that's a 50% utilization. So you're using 50% of your available credit. And the way the model works is the, the more, um, the, the higher that ratio or that utilization percentage, the riskier you are and the less points you receive. So if you close down one of those credit cards with a zero balance, then you're taking away the available credit limit amount from the calculation of the utilization, which can make your utilization look even higher. So. Uh, one tip or factoid that I hope everyone walks away from the, the, this call is to understand that from a credit score perspective, there's no advantageous reason to close down, um, you know, inactive zero balance uh, credit card accounts. I, I would add one thing though, and that is a good, that's exactly the perspective when it comes to focusing on your credit score. I would encourage people though, if you do have unused open accounts to monitor your credit report regularly and monitor the statements in the account for activity regularly, because a lot of people get tripped up sometimes if that card number gets exposed or gets into the hands of someone else, somebody may be using that card without your knowledge or permission and running up balances on the account. And if you've taken your eyes off of that activity because you're not using the card yourself, you could be exposing yourself to, um, to credit fraud uh, and uh, and identity theft because of that. So it's very important to monitor the activity on your unused accounts by checking your credit regularly, check your statement regularly to make sure that there is no other activity. And also if you had automated payments that were set up on that account and you may have forgotten about them, those charges could be hitting the account and running the balance up. So it's another reason not to take your eye off of an account that you're not actively using, but uh, otherwise it's really good advice related to the credit score there. Great. Thank you all so much. So be informed. Don't just pick up a bunch of credit cards <laughs> and then um, do your best to pay the balance off and then keep an eye on them just so it doesn't affect your credit negatively. Perfect. So at Military Saves, as we said, by paying off reducing debt, you are saving. And I know that I personally, once my debt was eliminated, I had so much left over from every pay period that I was able to quickly start a vacation fund, feed my retirement, have an emergency fund. So it's an amazing feeling. And anyone who has debt right now and you're feeling um, you know, just a little disconcerted or concerned, you can do this. There are ways to pay off your debt. And once you do, it's the best feeling and you're gonna feel like you have so much money left over once it's eliminated. So 
For those who have debt and want to get out as quickly as possible, Tom, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, what would your recommend, recommendation be for those people? And also, do those get out of debt or eliminate bad credit services that you see, you know, signs for on the road, websites, phone numbers, do any of those actually work? Well, Jackie, one thing uh, that your listeners can do is uh, uh, sign up for the freebies that you mentioned up at the beginning of the program and apply those to your debt. <laughs> but um, I see the the population kind of fall into two groups. I, I see in my interactions with consumers that have debt, you kind of have your do-it-yourselfers. And these are people who um, feel comfortable reading information out there, discerning that information, uh, searching for uh, assistance through reputable sites, et cetera, and kind of map out a plan that they try to put together themselves and have the discipline to follow that plan or the wherewithal to say it's not working, I need to go down a different avenue. So for those folks, that's great. And there's a lot of information out there from reputable organizations such as the uh, NFCC that Bruce works with, uh, credit bureaus, Visa, just a ton of entities out there that, uh, that have good information about how to get out of debt. On the other hand, you have, if you need help with this goal, and that's, that's nothing to be ashamed of, if you just you know, don't have the ability to do it yourself, then you definitely would be able to reach out for help. So reaching out to reputable companies. So this is where you need to do some research and make sure that the entity you're dealing with um, is, is a valid ent uh, entity in this space and it's not some kind of credit repair shop that's just trying to get your money. So you know, talk to people that you trust, you're in your network, um, do some research. And again, once you interact with an entity, just make sure that you feel comfortable. So you can go to the Better Business Bureau site, look at complaints, FTC, uh, et cetera, to help you kind of make sure you're comfortable. And one rule of thumb there is if they're charging fees up front, that's usually something that could be uh, suspect and you would want to research quicker um, versus uh, jumping in and, and using your services. So I guess the, the main mentor here for the, the people that need help is do your research, ask lots of questions, and then find that uh, entity, the nonprofit that can help you get out of debt. Perfect. And for those of you who are active duty military who are watching, you can always go on base to your, on your installation to receive the free resources available. For anyone else, Military Saves does have a wonderful partnership with the Yellow Ribbon Network, and they provide free counseling and free financial coaching as well. So we're, we'll be happy to drop a link to that. So let's see. Bruce, what advice do you have for folks who want to get out of debt quickly? And can you share some of the advantages to being debt free and how that can affect your credit, credit score and future interest rate? Yeah, uh, so if you're, if you're looking to get out of debt and you're looking to get out of debt quickly, I guess it depends on your starting point, what you're starting with, what kind of uh, accounts you're dealing with. And I think just to touch on something that Tom said, there's, you know, there are different situations. There are the self-serve folks and there are the people that need uh, further assistance that might be in a state of financial distress. And, you know, absolutely critical that if you're in a state of financial distress that you reach out and you get help from a reputable organization. I think all the things that Tom said, I don't want to rehash all that, but they are very applicable and it's very important that you make, you take extra care in deciding who you're going to reach out to to help you in such a uh, moment where you're financially vulnerable and you're looking to get the right kind of help to, uh, to repay your debt. And of course, my own organization, nfcc.org, is one of those trusted nonprofit organizations, a network of nonprofit financial counseling, but there are others out there. Uh, certainly do your research, check out who you want to reach out to, and then connect with a counselor. For the self-serve folks, uh, you've got a lot of choices if you want to quickly repay your debt. So there are a lot of different things that you can do. Some of these things, uh, surprisingly, not a lot of people take advantage of. We conducted our own survey uh, last year, a consumer survey, and we, un we uncovered the fact that uh, calling up and having a conversation with your creditor is not something people do when it comes to negotiating better terms, trying to get a lower interest rate or restructure the account in a way that is more affordable. And it, but it is something that everyone can do, um, at least in, insofar as having a conversation with your creditor to find out what, what options are better for you and more affordable uh, to help you repay the accounts that you owe. So my first uh, tip for people is just to, to communicate, reach out, talk to your creditor, learn more about the account that you owe, 
and find out if there are more affordable ways to, uh, to repay the debt that you have. They can refinance the account. They can do a balance transfer into another type of credit card with a lower interest rate, better rewards. And you, know, you don't know what you don't know. So don't make assumptions about what options are available. It's better to get it straight, straight from the source. So that's my first tip there. And once you've found more affordable uh, loans and lines of credit, that helps you further optimize the process you're gonna use to repay the debt. And you can pick any, any number of different methods. Uh, there are some popular methods out there that help you prioritize the higher interest rate accounts so that you put your extra money towards those first to pay them off quicker. And theoretically, that saves you more money over time. Uh, but there's also a, a method of debt repayment where you prioritize your lowest balance accounts first to put all your extra money towards them, pay them off, and then roll the money over into the next highest balance. And while some argue that that might not be the most, uh, that might not yield the greatest savings for you over time, it can be incredibly motivating to see accounts pay off fast. And if it's motivation that you need to get to the finish line, then obviously that's the, that's the method I would recommend for you. Uh, if you don't need that kind of motivation, you're just focused on long-term savings, uh, then you might want to consider the other options. And there are other different options available, but you could always do that. But before you look into refinancing options, before you look into opening new loans or lines of credit to roll your balances into, it's good to know where you stand with your credit and your credit health to understand the types of terms that you might be offered by your, by your lender. So it's a good idea to pull a copy of your credit report, look at the details of your credit report in addition to your credit score. Uh, I'm sure Tom can attest to the fact the score you're looking at may not be the one your lender uses, but at least it can be used as a benchmark to understand where you are on that scale. Uh, and it's really the details of your credit report that you wanna focus on if there are accounts that are showing up reporting late, et cetera. Uh, but I would recommend doing that first before negotiating and restructuring your debt to optimize the interest rates and then picking a plan to accelerate the repayment of that debt and, and start saving more over time. And another thing too, I would say, if you're struggling with savings and you don't have a lot of savings as you're focusing on repaying debt, keep in mind that as these accounts pay off, you have two options. You can continue rolling the full amount that you were allocating to one account over to the other to start paying that off in, in terms of the extra money or you can parse it out and take some of the extra money you were paying and start accelerating the growth of your savings. And I think there's a way that you can have your cake and eat it too in that plan uh, so that you continue making faster progress paying off your debt while starting to focus more and more of your budget towards uh, building your savings for emergencies and other things. Great, Bruce, thank you so much. And we'll be sure to link to the NFCC for anyone who's looking for the, the free, wonderful resources from this amazing nonprofit organization. And I can actually attest to some of the things you just said, because when I was grappling with credit card debt, I did call the credit card and they lowered my um, interest rate for me. They said, well, you've been paying on time and you've got a good history. And I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't even know you could do that. I just thought it was worth a shot. So really, I guess the worst thing they could say is no, <laughs> but it, it never hurts to ask. Um, and then as far as the debt repayment strategy, I ended up, even though I knew I would have saved more paying the highest interest, it did feel really good to just knock out those quick little credit cards, which is a small balance here, a small balance there. And then I only had one, <laughs> one debtor that I had to pay and I was applying that balance. So you're exactly right. And I can speak from experience um, that it is very motivating. Um, so you also brought up a really great point because I remember grappling with, well, what do I do? Do I save off debt or I'm sorry, pay off debt or do I put it in savings? Um, and I want to hear what your thoughts are on that as well, Tom, because Bruce, Bruce just said some really great options. You can do one or the other, or you can dedicate a little bit to each. What's your thought on, do you pay off debt first or do you save or do you do it simultaneously? I think it's going to be, up to the individual and their unique circumstances. So um, creating a rainy day fund is, is really important in the long term so that if you encounter an unexpected expense, you have some fallback on that or you lose your job or the coronavirus is a good example that created just unexpected chaos for many of our 
of your listeners and consumers out there. And having a rainy day fund could help weather some of that, uh, that distress. So uh, again, I don't think there's a simple do this first, do this second answer. It's really going to depend on the, the consumer and their credit profile, et cetera. From a credit score perspective, um, if your goal is to increase your FICO scores over time, in terms of paying down debt, the strategy that's gonna do that is to understand that the model looks at things in the aggregate, like your total revolving balances, your total installment balances, um, you know, your revolving utilization, et cetera, on the aggregate of all your balances. But it also looks at it in terms of number of accounts. So for example, you may be losing points because you have a high revolving utilization in total, but you also have, let's say, six credit cards with balances. And so having six cards with balances is more risky than having, let's say, two cards with balances. So from a score perspective, if your goal is to increase your score, the way to attack that debt is to attack the revolving debt first, because the revolving debt has more impact on your score than installment debt. And then within that revolving debt, try to pay off the lower balance cards first so that you have fewer accounts with, with uh, balances. And then you know apply your resources to the larger balances as a secondary approach. And that will have the most positive impact on your FICO scores. Great. And to clarify, an installment debt would be something like a mortgage or a, like an auto loan, right? Where it's a set. Okay, perfect. And Correct. For anyone tuning in. And then that revolving could be for credit card balances that are just, you know, going up and down. Hopefully not up and up and up. <laughs> okay. Um, so then let's talk a little bit about credit scores. What What is a desired credit score? Um, you're giving some really good information here, Tom. Um, so I guess, Bruce, I'm going to first ask you, um, what are some ways that someone can achieve an excellent credit rating? Well, you know, the advice that I give people to start with, I mean, first of all, know where you're starting from. So pull a copy of your credit report, look at your credit score. And when you pull a copy of your credit report with a credit score, you will, you will be given information that tells you what's influencing the number that you're looking at. So you can see, you know, if it's high or low, what the, what the issues may be. And then I think you should focus on uh, addressing any of the things that might be holding you back. And, you know, if you look at the FICO scale of, of 300 to 850, we all know that you want to be closer to the 850 than you do to the 300. And there are certain, there are some main things that you can do uh, to, to begin with, to make the most progress. And I always advise people, you don't have to know all the algorithms that are behind the curtain that helped determine your credit score, just focus on the things that we know are the primary influences. Keep your balances low, pay your bills on time, try to resolve any past due delinquent accounts as quickly as possible. Make sure you pay those off or resolve those in some kind of a way. Keep your appetite for debt uh, within reason. Don't apply for too many things you know, all at once. And if you just do those things, uh, you're uh, far ahead of the game in terms of push, moving your credit score in the right direction. A lot of the people that we work with at the NFCC are in situations where their credit scores are below average. Their credit scores are uh, well below average in the 500s or even the 400s, uh, low 600s. So if you're starting from that point, and let's say you've just finished paying off all the debt that was past due, and you're looking at a credit score that's in the five or 600s, again, if you focus just on the things that I talked about, there is a pathway for you to improve uh, if you stick with it. And the main thing, I think the biggest thing to focus on is not missing payments, because there's a lot of information out there that shows you uh, that how what the, what kind of damage uh, can be done to your overall credit health if you if you miss payments and those payments are reported as being missed and when you start moving to 60 90 120 days past due that damage uh, just continues to get progressively worse so you want to make sure that you avoid those kind of situations and that's why it's m most important to be proactive and reach out for help from organizations who can provide the kind of assistance and advice to get you back on track and avoid falling behind. Uh, if, if you see something like that coming ahead, if you know that you're gonna miss a payment next month, or if you're running out of savings and you don't have the money to cover these or 
uh, expenses that are driving up your credit card bills and you know that you're going to be uh, either making a partial or missing a payment, that's when you should reach out for help. Don't do it afterwards, do it beforehand, because there may be ways that you can avoid the worst of that scenario. And this goes back to something I mentioned earlier. If you're facing that, contact your creditor, be proactive. Don't wait for them to call you. Don't wait for the collection agent to call you. Uh, have the conversation, let them know, look, I might be missing a payment next month. What can you do for me? We saw during the, at the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, where a lot of the creditors were offering um, special programs for temporary hardship that allowed people to skip payment without penalty uh, in the early days of the pandemic. The, the, I guess the secret is that those are not entirely unique programs that were just stood up for the pandemic. There are temporary hardship programs that creditors have available uh, that could, could be applied to your situation if you call up and have the conversation and ask for it. Uh, but again, communicate, find out uh, what's on the table and, and what solutions are available in that situation. Great, so I, I love that you're saying that communication really is one of the keys, but also paying on time. And I think this might be a bit of a generational difference, but my mom recently was like, oh, I don't think we paid this bill. And they're still, still doing in, in the mail bills. And we know that the mail has slowed down and people aren't receiving bills on time. So they might be paying them late. And I said, why don't you just have automatic payments? Like I've got them set up through my bank, through a credit card. And so every month it just comes out for things that are the same, like my internet every month. And that way I know it's taken care of and it's not going to sneak up on me and affect my credit score. So if you can afford to have those payments drafted, that's been a great tool for me. Do you have a thought? And, and I'm, I'm just reminded of one other thing too, just because uh, we talked about credit cards, loans and other types of, of accounts that are commonly reporting to the activity to the credit bureau. But just because you're dealing with a utility bill that does not show up on your credit bureau, don't think that it won't if you stop paying it because it, eventually it's gonna go into a collection status and it's very likely that that collection agency will start reporting the debt when, at a time when you don't want something like that to show up on your credit report and that can influence your credit score negatively. That's why it's important to treat every bill regardless of whether you think it's reporting or not as a priority and make sure that you're keeping those uh, financial obligations up to date. Excellent. How about you, Tom? What would you say is a good credit score ballpark to kind of shoot for? Um, and then if someone does have a good credit score, what are some of the advantages to that? Sure. So again, each lender determines what the cutoff is that makes most sense from them, most sense for their credit risk uh, management objectives. But generally speaking, uh, scores in the upper 600s all the way up to obviously 850 are generally considered good scores that will um, help the consumer get approved for credit. Um, obviously, higher scores may get better terms in terms of lower interest rates, et cetera. But generally speaking, scores in the upper 600s uh, pass most lenders' cutoffs. And um, you know, I think one of the things that uh, I think is important for your listeners to understand is the, the FICA score is dynamic. It changes over time as the information on your credit report changes. And if you have blemishes on your credit report, uh, a poor score is not going to, it's not designed to haunt you forever. So as time ages and that delinquency comes further and further away and your new credit behavior show that you're managing credit well, you start to receive positive points for that new behavior and the, the loss of points for that delinquency or mispayment become less uh, intrusive on the score as time passes. So um, it truly is a, a tool that you have control over as a consumer. Fantastic. And I know that we've talked briefly on credit reports. Tom, can you please tell us how can one pull their free credit report and how often should they be doing that and what should they be looking for when they check it out? Sure. So what I usually recommend is consumers can go to a site called the annualcreditreport.com, which was created by the FTC, and you can get access to your credit reports from all three credit reporting agencies, either online or through snail mail, if you prefer that. Uh, typically, uh, or historically, that was once a year, you would get uh, access for those for free. Uh, the good news is during this coronavirus, if there is any good news in terms of the coronavirus, um, they are enabling consumers to get access to their reports for free once a week. So this is definitely a great resource that consumers should take care of. And once you get a hold of your credit report, it's really important that you take a detailed review of it to make sure that you're seeing 
uh, that the information on you being reported is accurate. And if you see mistakes or inaccurate information, there's a process that you can go through called disputing. And it's all automated uh, that you can dispute information on the credit report. And then the credit reporting agencies have 30 days to investigate that, that dispute and make a decision if it's accurate, uh, was an accurate dispute or not. Um, and in terms of how frequently you should uh, get access to your report, um, I would recommend at the bare minimum, at least annually. And then if you know you're going to be applying for credit, like uh, a mortgage refinance, or you, you know you're going to be needing a new car in the next couple of months, to pull it several months ahead of time and, and to make sure that your report is as clean as it can be and your score is looking good before you go and apply for that credit. Fantastic. And I know we've, we've touched on the um, coronavirus pandemic a little bit, and it's got me thinking about the stimulus payments that have come out. And if you're in a position where you are receiving a windfall payment, so you're getting stimulus money, or you're receiving a tax refund at the end of the tax year, you can always use that money and you can save it and it can be part of your emergency fund, which will prevent you from accruing more debt. Because if you've already got money there saved up for a rainy day, that can stop the cycle of you having to take out a payday loan or a personal loan or a, you know charging it to your credit card and it's just by being proactive and saving now when you may feel like you don't need it yet you'll thank yourself later for doing that um so there is kind of a worst case scenario that i i have a lot of friends um and people i've talked to that have personally experienced this and it's something that's very difficult for them to talk to but they sort of felt like it was their only option at the end and that's bankruptcy um so I'd like to talk a little bit about that first and how it affects your credit. And um, Bruce, if you could go ahead and answer this first, I'll start with you. So under what circumstances have you had clients file bankruptcy? And then how did that end up affecting them, their finances and their credit? Yeah, and that's a really good question because it's, it is certainly a source of shame for people. A lot of people who are, have been uh, found themselves in a situation where they're considering bankruptcy. And there are all kinds of implications for going through that process. And there are some unique implications for going through that pro process for uh, the men and women who, who serve in uniform and, uh, and those who are government contractors. And I want to mention that as well as we talk about this, but it's a very, it's a very sensitive issue. And I've always said that it should be a tool of last resort. This is something that should not be the first option you choose. It should be among the very last after you've taken a detailed look at your financial situation and you have consulted a financial professional who can give you uh, impartial advice uh, uh, that is unique to your circumstances to help you understand all of the choices that you have available to help you avoid filing bankruptcy. Uh, again, just stressing the point that it is not a first option, it is a last option. And while it may sound quick and easy, if you listen to the advertisements that are put forward by bankruptcy attorneys and other practitioners, it's not as quick and easy as it sounds and it can, be, uh, it can be a process that gets in the way of some of your financial goals instead of assisting you in achieving those goals, whether it's financial stability or, or the purchase of a home or a car, et cetera. So there are lasting consequences for filing bankruptcy and it should not go unmentioned about that and the fact that it's a last resort. And one of the, one of the main purposes for, for nonprofit credit counseling agencies like those in the network of the National Foundation for Credit Counseling is to provide that touch point for people who are in distress so that they can talk to a nonprofit financial professional who can give them objective advice based on their financial circumstances to help them understand all of their options, which may include bankruptcy, but may not be limited to that and then help people make the choice that's best for them. And I think the, to answer your question about the examples that I've seen where people have ended up filing bankruptcy, in my own personal experience as a credit counselor in the past, um, I, it's the circumstances where all other options they may have tried or considered and have failed, and then they go ahead and they move to bankruptcy. But those are, you know, there, you think about examples of, of why people are filing bankruptcy right now. There are still people who have a lot of, uh, of out-of-pocket medical debt that is not covered by insurance. And that is a, that is a primary driver of, of bankruptcy filings right now for a lot of people. 
Uh, so it's not just credit card debt. And a lot of times these are situations where people are dealing with unforeseen circumstances where there wasn't enough savings to cover the type of emergencies that they were facing and they had to end up in debt somehow uh, to cover these costs. And in terms of the medical debt, this is where medical care was you know, essential to life. And the choice was either find a way to cover it or you know, end up getting worse and, and possibly losing your life. So it's a tough choice for anybody to have to make. And in those situations where other types of repayment options can't work, then bankruptcy is something that you could consider. And it will have an impact on how you borrow and how you have access to loans and lines of credit afterwards. Uh, and there's a myth about bankruptcy where people say, well, you can't qualify for a loan after filing bankruptcy. You can, but the terms and conditions attached to that loan uh, you know, might make you sick if you look at the fine print. There's, uh, there's a high cost of borrowing post-bankruptcy. You're uh, seen as a risk. Uh, and so you, you could be facing high interest rates and a lower threshold of credit approval. The, balance, the, the, account, the size of the account you may want may not be what you get. And the interest rate you may get could be in the high double digits uh, and it would be costly for you to pay it back which makes it very expensive to rebuild your credit under those circumstances after filing bankruptcy, because you're basically starting at square one. Your, your quality, you, the, the only lines of credit and loans that you may qualify for would be collateralized or starter types of accounts with high interest rate. And you're just gonna have to dig your way back to where you were with your credit health. Uh, but again, that's why bankruptcy is something that you should really think through carefully before you file and try to find ways where you can affordably repay the entire amount of debt, such as a debt management plan administered by a nonprofit credit counseling agency, or even uh, situations where you as a consumer may negotiate your own debt settlement um, and work out a deal to affordably exit those arrangements before they get worse or before they come after you and sue you uh, for the money. So. A lot of other options besides bankruptcy for, for some people. So certainly consider those. All right, that's really helpful information, Bruce. So be as proactive as possible. Reach out to the free um, resources, nonprofits that are available, and don't forget to communicate with your lenders. And you are right. I, I had heard recently that the number one reason for bankruptcy is medical costs. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but when you said that, I thought that's true. And it, it just goes to show it's not always um, a choice. It's not something that you have done. It's something that you're choosing to do. And this, this definitely outweighs um, the consequence of losing one's life. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, Tom, since you work with Bicare and Scores, what does a bankruptcy do to um, the credit report? How long does it stay on there? And is there any way to fast track getting that um, to where it no longer affects your credit? Sure, so um, if a bankruptcy is filed on a consumer's credit report, It'll stay on that credit report for seven years if it's a completed Chapter 13 bankruptcy and 10 years for Chapter 7 bankruptcies. And in terms of the impact it has on SCORE, it kind of, it'll depend on what the consumer's credit profile looks like before they file the bankruptcy. So you kind of may have two scenarios here where you have a person who's missed payments and has been struggling to, to make payments as agreed due to financial difficulties and now they're deciding to do bankruptcy, the impact of that bankruptcy on the score may be less than what you would expect because they already have exhibited mispayment behaviors that has been uh, taken into consideration by the score. Uh, and then you have the other kind of cohort, which is what we call surprise bankruptcies. So these are people whose credit report looks clean. They are potentially very overextended on revolving debt, but they have no mispayments. And then they file for bankruptcy to absolve themselves from all that debt. And those ones are where, you know, your score will drop quite a bit from the bankruptcy because there's no uh, indication of mispayments happening before the bankruptcy is filed. Um, again, uh, with any type of delinquency and bankruptcy included, as it ages on the credit report and becomes more uh, in the distance and your new credit behaviors are showing that your paying is agreed, it will have less impact on the score and your we'll get more positive points for that more recent behavior showing you can manage the credit as agreed. But bankruptcy uh, in itself is very, is considered a very negative item by the score. 
And, um, you know, we'll reflect that uh, in terms of a lower score if you do file for bankruptcy. And, and I would mention too that when considering bankruptcy as an option, it, it, you also have to consider what is causing you to be in a situation where you're having to file bankruptcy. And bankruptcy is not, is not intended to solve the underlying reason for you falling behind on your debt or getting into trouble. So you wanna make sure not only if you are filing bankruptcy, you wanna make sure you're also taking steps to address the root cause of the problem because you can't just turn around the following year and refile bankruptcy. The system does not allow you to do that uh, that quickly. So you're doing yourself a favor if you reach out and get help with some of the issues that might come up again and put you in the same spot later. So it's, it's you know, it, it, bankruptcy itself is not a solution. Perfect. Another thing too is, um, yeah there's a cost to filing bankruptcy. So a lot of consumers think I'll just go file bankruptcy and I'll be absolved of all my debt. It's a legal process and there's legal fees that the consumer has to pay. So it's not a free process either. And I think a lot of consumers uh, who file for bankruptcy get shocked by that expense aspect of uh, the legal cost of filing. Wow, okay, I was unaware of that. So thank you, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. And I think Bruce, what you just said is exactly right. And that's part of our behavioral economics with military saves. You've got to start making those, those healthy habits and choices that are going to lead you to the financial freedom that you're looking for. And if you want extra support, we invite you to take our military saves pledge because we will send you goal specific text reminders, emails, tips and resources to keep you on track. And eliminating your debt is one of the goals that we offer. So please do. I've got a link to it to the video. So please do take the military saves pledge. So gentlemen, this has been so informative. Before we sign off, I'd like to ask if there's anything that either of you would like to add. Well, I would just, uh, I would just go back and repeat a couple of things that I mentioned uh, when it comes to striking the right balance between paying off your debt and, and, and contributing to your savings. Um, you know, use every resource that you can possibly use. And Jackie, you just made uh, a great reference to the tools and the resources that are available through Military Saves. Um, and I would say uh, an equally valuable resource goes back to what I was talking about before is, is your ability to communicate in that process. Reach out, have conversations with the people that you owe. Seek out the guidance and the resources of, of nonprofit credit counselors if you want somebody to help you work out a plan and put together a, a budget and a, and a debt repayment plan that makes sense. And of course, use all of the tools and services that are available through Military Saves. And if you're facing a crisis, uh, especially military families, you've got great organizations that are there to help you that can give you interest-free loans or even grants. That's Army Emergency Relief, Navy Marine Corps Relief Society, Air Force Aid Society, Coast Guard Mutual Assistance. And I think often those services are either misunderstood or overlooked in times of financial crisis and can be a tremendous benefit to military families who need all the help they can get uh, quickly. Great, thank you for mentioning those resources, Bruce, and for reinforcing um, some of the highlights that you discussed, I appreciate that. How about you, Tom, anything you'd like to add? Sure, I would say that um, you know, reducing one's debt and becoming more credit eligible is, is not an easy process, but it is something that's achievable. And I kind of link it to, uh, to a, a plan to lose weight where there's really not a whole lot of quick fixes to, to get a quick increase in your score. Just like uh, it's not easy to lose 20 pounds in a day if you just start riding an exercise bike that day. So the best strategy is to uh, you know, acknowledge where you are and then lay out a plan to where you want to be and then leveraging the resources that uh, Bruce mentioned to help you get there. And uh, it is possible to turn around and get out of debt and become um, a debt-free uh, uh, contributor uh, to the to the credit marketplace. Excellent. Well, thank you both so much for your time and your expertise today. I think this is wonderful information for our viewers. Thank you all for tuning in to our Save by Reducing Debt Midday Money Chat. We've got one more week of Military Saves Month next week, which is Save as a Family. So we hope that you'll join us for that. Please do take your Military Saves Pledge. 
be sure to enter our $500 on Saving for Sweepstakes. And also, last but not least, comment below with your favorite takeaway from today's chat for a chance at a $50 gift card of your choice from Military Families Magazine. So thank you so much, Bruce and Tom, for joining me. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Absolutely. And thanks for tuning in. Have a wonderful day.